Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. My name is Renee Ventris. I have been a Torpreneur member for a long, long time, and I'm really excited that they asked me to be a guest host um, to introduce you to a really, really cool and dynamic guy who has got a fantastic tour company in uh, New Orleans. It is called Big Easy Walking Tour. So let's say hello to Quay Frazier. Hello, Quay. Hey, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm awesome. Uh, it's good to hear. Good to see you. Okay, yeah. we have to address immediately all the instruments behind you. I'm looking oh, at yeah. clarinets and saxophones. Uh, what's the story? Do you play all of those or are they art? What's going on? I actually play all of these. These are um, these are my horns. Sometimes I like to swap out different horns, but uh, I have the blessing and luxury of living in um, a live music uh capital of the world really well i think it's new orleans louisiana so i mm -hmm. uh yeah i'm a saxophonist typically but i also play woodwinds when they call me for those types of gigs you know oh. yeah that's fantastic do you have um your own band or do you play with just different bands are you a solo artist a freelancer what what would people need to know about you for music if they wanted to try and find you so um i you know i started out just as a you know jazz musician and playing specifically just jazz and New Orleans jazz but um I've gotten to play all types of different you know musics from um playing with people like Tony 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 and uh even like Lil Wayne and all that kind of stuff so Get uh, out of here. Cool. but I, I play right now with uh, a great band leader and trombonist his name is Corey Henry and uh, the, the band is called the Treme Funk Tet and mm. uh yeah, and I also have my own band. I just started it recently. It's called Smoking on Some Brass. Uh, so check that out. I have some new music being unveiled this year. So yeah. I love it. All right. So so do you focus more on like um, jazz? Is it Zydeco? Is it just kind of that whole New Orleans brass funk style? Is it your own style? What kind of music uh, do you love to play? Yeah, like the uh, I play a lot of the New Orleans music. You know, I, mm -hmm. I call myself a New Orleans saxophone player because. That's the place that shaped me and how I, you know, I've been in New Orleans since I was a teenager. So mm -hmm. um, the, you know, funk scene, the jazz scene, um, all that stuff has shaped me into where I'm at now. So, yeah. Well, that's a great segue to what I was going to ask next. So people need to know a little bit more about you, about your history um, yeah. and how uh, a musician got into doing these big, easy walking tours. Lead us through yeah. that uh, little journey right there. Well, you know, um, it, it you know immediately after um, um, getting to New Orleans, I started studying jazz. I got I went to University of New Orleans and studied uh, jazz with people like Edward Peterson and um, Ellis Marcellus and Evan Christopher, people like that. And um, I graduated uh, school in about 2012. And um, <clears throat> you know, after the you know, the 2008 crash and all that, um, some jobs were limited. Of course, I wanted to play music, but that's not how it works. You have to be able to support yourself if you don't have all the gigs and things like that. So sure. um, you have to do what you have to do until you can do what you want to do. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I immediately got into uh, sales. Like if you looked up uh, jobs on these different sites mm -hmm. after all, you know, the 2008 crash, there was no job except for sales jobs. So sure. I immediately got into sales and, um, I, I worked at places like, uh, Wyndham timeshare, um, and, uh, selling timeshare sales. And, uh, I also worked at yelp.com for a bit. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Um, and I mean, there was a period of time where I, uh, was just playing music and um just trying to you know get better at my craft and all that mm -hmm. um but i needed uh i needed money and it was uh, i i i started working at a a bigger tour company in new orleans and i was essentially selling tours to people and mm -hmm. while there i uh, i found out that there was you know number one not many african-american tour guides in the city of New Orleans, when there's so many black culture bearers in this right. city, uh, which was kind of odd. And I also realized that there was no um, musicians that were giving jazz tours. And uh -huh. 
So two yeah. really big uh, parts of New Orleans, two things that really helped to define that culture and community. You just really didn't see being represented in the tourism industry where, as, where you were working. Exactly. Okay. So, I, you know, I, I thought it was really odd. I was like, man, there's nobody doing music tours that really know about music. And, you know, if you know more about jazz and all that, it's a it's a history based mm -hmm. music. You can't play the music and just make up stuff. You have to go learn from your ancestors and people before right. you to to know what they play, to be able to play what you play. And that's really what jazz is. And and so that comes with a lot of history and knowledge of how things came about. Um, so what I uh, I did then is I um, I had the great ideas. Oh, I'm going to start a company. And I uh, I remember telling my mom, um, <clears throat> I was like, Mom, I want to start a, a tour business. And she's like, uh, when would you rather have a job? And I was like, <laughs> OK. Uh, thank you. You know, I, I do. Yeah, I do want a job, but right, um, right. But this is a job too. She's like, well, you know, why don't you just go get a job? That's how it go works. work nine to five somewhere, and then yeah. start a little tour company on your free time. Is that kind of? Yeah, and I love my mom. By the way, my mom is one of the most amazing uh, singers in the world. I believe she's oh. an amazing singer. That's why I've started in music, coming from a musical family. But okay, uh, wait, has she ever sung with you, playing a you know saxophone in the background? Yeah, she's done that. And, you know, the reason why I play saxophone is I, I tell people uh, I was at uh, I would at a young kid, I would uh, be forced to sing solos at church every Sunday because I had uh, stage fright, you know, and my mom would just be like, get up there and I'd sing my solo. And then sometimes I go home and cry. I'd be like, Mom, I just <laughs> I just don't want to play saxophone. I just don't want to sing anymore. So yeah. she's like, if you're not going to sing, you got to play saxophone. So she picked the saxophone out for me. So that's Excellent. my mother. Um, I love it. I love yeah. it. You know, she must have seen something in you and knew that there is a performer and a talented musician in there somewhere. You just had to find what your instrument was and your instrument wasn't your voice. It was your saxophone. Yeah. I mean, I sing now. I sing now more often, but okay. you know, thanks to my mom, I, I'm a woodwindist. So yeah. Awesome. That's a great talent to have. So you told her, what year was this that you told her you were going to start um, your tour company? Because I believe your story is very similar to a lot of us who get into the tour yeah. industry, you know, in a way that we didn't really expect, but it's something that a lot of people were like, you can make money doing that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? so. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you know, the thing about being a tour operator and starting that is I immediately re realized that I, the, uh, the startup cash I may need for a different business, I would not need for uh, the tour business. Uh, right. Essentially, you are taking people around and um, and you may not have to you know, have any overhead or anything like that. So right. it's a one of those business you can like step in and start from ground up. So I realized that and I pushed through and um, I began to ask people, I was like, you know, hey, um, what do you think about doing some type of uh, tour on uh, this street called Frenchman Street in New Orleans? And if mm -hmm. you've ever ever been to New Orleans, um, you, you'll find this place that's outside of the French Quarter. Uh, right. Everybody knows of Bourbon Street. <clears throat> but in the recent time, people are trying to figure out uh, this new place called Frenchman Street. And, Frenchman and how street far away, just to give people an yeah. idea, how far away from Bourbon Street is Frenchman Street? And it's not in the French Quarter? Not in the French Quarter. It's actually um, one neighborhood over. It. Okay. It's in the Marigny neighborhood. So it's not far away. You can literally walk from the French Quarter to French Street like right away. Okay. Um, but it's traditionally been a place for locals. And it's a right. traditionally a place where people go see jazz music. Clubs like Snug Harbor and Spotted Cat and um, Cafe Negro. Places like that. And okay. um Originally, when I asked people, is it a good idea? They're like, why would anybody want to take a tour of a place they could already go themselves, you know? And I was yeah. like, well, that sucks. Well, let me <laughs> let me see what I can do. And then and then it went and kind of grew. I, I started doing the, t the tours immediately on Groupon. And mm -hmm. for about a year, I, I didn't have a lot of people. I wouldn't make any money doing the right. tours. It was more for so you use uh, the Groupon to really get the brand awareness out there, knowing that it wasn't going to be big earnings, but it was going to start generating, you know, that buzz and get more people interested. So brand yeah. awareness was what you got out of that Groupon. 
exactly and you know back then ten dollars was a lot of money to me so mm-hmm. you know i like i'll do the tour and i can go buy a sandwich and i was pretty happy with that <laughs> Wow. Well, so let's talk about that for a little bit, because, you know, our audience is mainly tour operators all over the Mm -hmm. world who are interested in how other tour operators did what they do, um, Mm -hmm. you know, learning about the struggles and how they overcame those. So two things that you have mentioned is doing a walking tour, not having any overhead of a brick and mortar. Basically, all of your assets are human. Right. And, yeah, and exactly. they know and their, their knowledge of the locations that you're going, of music, the connection between culture, music and tourism in New Orleans. And the second part of what you said was, why would I go someplace on a tour, pay for a tour for someplace that I can go on my own? So talk about that part, since it's, you know, it's a walking tour and you don't have that, um, you know, that overhead. But what were some of the surprises at the beginning that you had, you know, costs on for starting a walking tour company? Now, you know, in the in the beginning, because uh, I wanted to create a different experience, it what it, what the tour is today is not what it was then. Uh, okay, it was, it was an hour shorter, and um, it uh, didn't include some of the things that it includes now. I I, mm-hmm. I think at, at first I would encourage people to maybe buy drinks at places, and um, I realized that maybe I should include a um uh drinks inside of the tour price um and that increased my um my uh good reviews um but i think uh by 2019 though i was doing the tour for about a year uh in about springtime 2019 Mm -hmm. um I made a change and that specific change was when I started using Airbnb experiences. Okay. And, um, and I, I guess I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty big proponent on Airbnb experiences because that's a great place you can test out ideas. Sure. And um, what I began to try to see is I, I began to look up different um, tours in New Orleans and I was like, okay, there's a mixology class over here. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's people doing haunted pub crawls over here. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was thinking, what if I were to combine all these elements into one tour? Is that too much for people to grapple? Is that, you know, uh, it may be seen all over the place, but I tried it. I tried to do that. And I worked with several of the, um, the music venues on the street and worked out deals where they, um, uh, uh, I'm able to get drinks at a certain price and things like that. But, you know, I think what's most importantly is one of my first venues we go to, uh, yeah. they teach the, uh, the guests how to make a drink that they're going sure. to get. So I, I like how I, I was able to implement that in. And it's kind of cool that they are excited about teaching people how to make drinks. And, well, so, yeah. so along those lines, uh, it sounds like another great part of it was collaborating with a business that was like, look, I'll bring people to you, you teach them to make a drink, and then we'll talk about what your place has to offer, all of these things, to part of my tour, and you get to be a part of that experience, right? So yeah. collaborating with other businesses has really helped to probably do at least two things, um, expand your offerings so that, you know, you have something more, a more variety to offer different types of people who might want to book a tour. And then two brings in those other businesses that you collaborate with to now you've got these partnerships and another company that can also help to spread word about the tours. So do they exactly. also help to market, you know, what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, you know, just to give you an idea of what it's like in new Orleans, there's all, there's constant traffic on that mm-hmm. street. It's basically a two block, uh, <clears throat> two block worth of about 20 different music venues on this street. Wow. And just two blocks. And just two blocks. And it's, uh, it's grown. I would say since, since the saints won the super bowl back in 2010, a lot of money maybe poured into the French street more than it did before. Um, And when that happened, you have almost the same kind of look in shape as what Bourbon street may have been like, you can walk down this two blocks of rate of streets and, enter these clubs if you want to now the only difference is that some of the clubs do have a cover charge because it is live music um that's the main difference but the french street is really cool because uh they shot drake's in my feelings music video on the street okay Um, even the movie girls trip was filmed on 
Frenchman Street. Oh, uh, I saw that. All right. Is yeah. it really line over the road like that? No, uh, they did not <laughs> see I, they did not zip line. Uh, uh, I don't think it's possible to zip line on Bourbon Street. That would have been very dangerous. And I'm I would sure. have told people not to do that. So but yeah, you can zip line on Frenchman Street, apparently. So Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay, so um so you did so you yeah, so you started the walking tour and you really had very little overhead. You just basically were doing the tours by yourself and yeah. you know you just it's a matter of you know leveraging your knowledge to do that. One of the problems that people run into right now, big, the biggest challenge for a lot, are yeah. uh, getting the right guides, making sure that sure. the guides are, you know, that they they have loyalty, they stick around. Um, how many guides do you have on your team now? Uh, so right now we have, uh, I would say, two full time, me and another okay. uh, guide, and then maybe three um, part time guides that I use. Um, now that's changed. Uh, Prior to COVID and after COVID, um, it, it pretty much is just me and another tour guide right now. Okay. And, uh, trying to get uh, things rolling in a certain way how I want them to be. But um, in terms of getting guides, I, you know, for some reason, I've always gravitated towards other people who have been in cells. Sure. I think, I think, uh, to be a tour guide, you have to sell people on this idea or this story. Um, yeah. Yeah. Being like, you know, uh, other types of, uh, you know, maybe like a teacher works well as too. Um, my mm -hmm. other tour guide, Pandy, she's a, uh, she's a teacher. And I think teachers and salespeople are the best people to hire. Number one, they know how to, you know, uh, captivate an audience. They know how to get some people to buy into something they haven't, you know, maybe wouldn't buy into in the first place. Right. Um, well, then teachers are really good at herding cats, which is what we all yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, <laughs> I, I mean, being an operator. I, you know, I, I did some teaching in, um, in the past, but not to the extent that my tour guide Pandy has. And I've mm -hmm. learned stuff from her all the time because, you know, something you can do with the kid, you can do with adults too. Yeah, um, yeah, a lot of times it's exactly <laughs> the same thing. Um, yeah. you, know, so you bring up a good point about who to look for. So yeah. that's definitely something that we see a lot of questions on in the Torpreneur uh, Facebook group. People are always asking, how do you get great guides? Who do you, you know, where do you get them? You know, how do you recruit for them? So I was kind of expecting you to say that you talk to other musicians who you know, you know, you know what it means to be a struggling musician and to need that money and to be able to do something that's flexible with your schedule. Have you ever looked at other musicians or is that really not the, uh, the target for the kind of guides that you want no it is i'm glad you mentioned that and you know what i'm what i'm doing currently now is i am getting other musicians involved by the way pandy is an amazing uh vocalist too so i would say number oh, one wow. <laughs> number well, one for, all together <laughs> yeah number one for my my uh french street live music pub crawl is uh i would say is musicians you can right we probably could not do that tour without mm -hmm. having some connection to that street. Um, sure. So yeah, because you have to know, uh, you know, something about it. You, well, you could give somebody some papers to tell them, you know, some of the facts and figures. If somebody who has come up there, seen the changes, understands what it's all about, they give a much more authentic tour. Is that kind of what you're getting at with musicians oh, being guys? Yeah, of course. And, and I, um, you know, be it the big thing about New Orleans is that I would say, <laughs> Half the whole city have either been in a band in, in their high school uh, mm -hmm. or, or play in a brass band. It's such a part of the culture. Right, so right. More than any other place you could ever go to is familiarity with playing music or being around music. So yeah. um, my goal right now is to take some of the some people that may have not thought about being a tour guide, like, uh, you know, some young African-American kids may be playing in a brass band on the street and i'm i'm right now getting them to kind of understand that um another you know avenue for for money or for employment would be a tour guide and outlining the things that they already do you know yeah yeah kind of it's something to really bring it in and roll it in and who yeah. knows even if they have a gig the night after the tour you know of the tour letting people know look, live music at yeah. such a place i happen to be the vocalist or you know whatever you know it's a way to really bring business not just to your tours but also to the venues that support you know your tourism efforts right is yeah. that something that you see kind of bringing all of those together yeah and i, I you know and i 
I do want to also say that, you know, there's a, maybe not been a, like a stigma or anything for being a tour guide as an African-American and maybe mm-hmm. why you don't see it. And, uh, you know, when talking to young black kids or black people, um, they're just not aware that that's a way to go. And I, I have right. to kind of explain to them that uh, number one, it's probably the hardest, easiest job you ever have. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Listen, it's simple, but it's not easy in some terms, right? I mean, yeah. it's, you know, you, you can you can do this, you know, you can learn this, you can be a part of this, but you also have to really, you know, engage with the people and get them to feel a part of that experience. Um, and speaking of that, you mentioned it, you know, being, you know, a, a black uh, tour operator, um, yeah. which obviously, so am I, I, I get that. Um, but do you find that people who are not black feel like, oh, am I allowed to do this tour? Is this just a black thing? They wouldn't understand, you know what I mean? Tell me yeah. a little bit more about that, about who your, you know, your target you know, audience is. Um, yes, the tour does um, have some great African-American history within New Orleans. It's about jazz, it's about music, you know, predominantly you know, things that are associated with us you know, as black people. Um, yeah. But what about non-black people? What, what what do you find? There's plenty of them in New Orleans and also as tourists. So tell me a little bit about how you you reach an audience that doesn't look like you. So I think a lot of other tour operators may have that same kind of you know issue. Yeah, um, uh, I would say number one, I uh, that's a great question, and um, <clears throat> you know, with my tour specifically, is I mix the pub crawl element of a you know a pub crawl going around from different bars with uh history mm-hmm. um and when i mix the history in new orleans history there's the big impact of of slavery and right. um i bring that up and i think that uh because of the climate that we're in we're uh, a lot of people are wanting to hear um those types of things and at times oh. some people are a little hesitant to want to hear about it. But I, you know, I grew up in a very, um, you know, religious home and I would say old school home with my grandmother. And I, I probably would, my grandma would talk about, you know, the past a lot right. because she wanted me to know that, you know, this is part of your future. So, sure. um, you know, and you no, know, it's supposed to be a little uncomfortable, right? No one should yeah. be comfortable, no matter what color we are, whether or not it was our ancestors who were enslaved. Um, it's not a comfortable topic, but yeah. it, it's not supposed to be. And I think it's important for people to really understand, you know, the genesis and the, you know, the, the root of where jazz came from. Uh, yeah. Something that my, my father has said to me is, you can't understand my rhythm if you don't understand my blues, you know? Yeah, so, it, that's what I tell people before I talk about. So on a route on on the route uh we encounter uh a plaque that says 12 years a slave and it talks about Mm -hmm. the the movie 12 years slave and i talk about the book as well yeah and i I tell people that uh the reason why i talk about it is that uh later on when we talk about how new orleans created jazz um it's kind of important to know its impact and we kind of uh, i think the 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 biggest part that i talk about new orleans was one of the biggest places for um, the sale of a slave, but it also had the most free people of color in the South at the same time. You mm-hmm. know? So all those kind of elements, people of all different types of backgrounds are very interested, whether you're cool. white, black, or um, Latino, you have all, you know, all these people, uh, I think they, people like experiences that, uh, that do dive into some uncomfortable things because you know yeah. why they could just go on YouTube and um, search things themselves, you know, but when they're exactly. on these experiences, they, they want to feel something they probably wouldn't have felt before. You know, yeah. And actually to be in a place where, you know, those things actually happened. I live here in Virginia. So, you know, there's a, you know, a lot of, you know, things from Confederate and Union here. There's a whole lot of history there. And being actually on those grounds, being on the, you know, the burial sites from the enslaved and, you know, things of that, that nature. It's a story that everyone should know. It's not a story just for Black people to know. Uh, yeah. A lot of us grew up, like you said, with a grandmother that told us about that and their history and ancestors. It's it's America's history. It's everyone's history to, yeah. to be able to understand. 
everyone. So your tours are for everyone. And yeah. it sounds like the fact that you're putting out there, you know, that history and then the mixology and things that appeal to different people of different cultures uh, makes yeah. it so that you're not pigeonholing yourself on having only, you know, only black tour guides or only, you know, black clients. You want your tours yeah. to be able to reach everyone. And yeah. so, you know, that's something also that I had to deal with at first. Kind of on the opposite side, though, because I'm in an area where um, it's not predominantly black, you know, where it's, it's very mixed, you know, with different yeah. cultures. So to make sure that people understand that the tour is for everyone, history, everyone should know music that, you know, crosses over, you know, racial lines. Do you ever have to address that in your marketing? Um, you know, because I, I know that other tour operators may be wondering, do I need to say it's not just for black people? Come on out. You know, or what do you do yeah. to make sure that everyone feels welcome? Um. I think that, um, yeah, I, you know, I show, you know, in my, uh, you know, marketing, I do show people of all different types of uh, colors. Why? Because if you didn't do that, some people may feel uh, uncomfortable. You have to see, show people all different types of ages, too, in your exactly. marketing. Exactly. But diversity is more than just yeah. skin type, right? And, yeah. you know, when you put uh, your headline and your title, Pub Crawl, the first mm -hmm. thing a person maybe over 50 or 60 is this for me. And that's why I try to include in my pictures in the very beginning, um, uh, people that took the tour who were maybe even 70 and 80 and were right. dancing up in the, the music venues, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's just, a, you, you, you can't let someone, um, uh, you know, get their own idea about something you have to, you have to show it to them so they could, you know, understand, I think. So. Yeah, it's important for people, you know, to be able to see themselves on your tour, to understand right. that they are somebody who is welcome. And that's something I think a lot of operators, especially when they're first getting started, are wondering what's the best way to do that, you know? And so, yeah. like you just said, the visual, having videos that show people of all different ages, all sizes, different ages. Uh, you know, races, religions, whatever it is, everybody is welcome, everybody who wants to know about it. Um, even the testimonials, you know, like video testimonials, are a great way exactly. to be able to show the diversity in the audience who this is for. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so I think you've definitely helped some people who are kind of struggling with how to do that um, mm -hmm. to, to understand that that's a great way. Just show them. You don't have to sit there and tell people what your audience is when you can show them who your audience is. Exactly. Um, what was one of the things that happened when you first got started or when you started to make the changes, you know, COVID yeah. notwithstanding, um, yeah. that was a surprising challenge to you for a walking tour. Uh, yes. Did you think that, oh, well, this is going to be pretty easy to do blah, blah, blah. But then along the way, you found out, OK, this is a challenge I didn't think about. And now I need to work through it. What was that challenge like? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I uh, in my own um, um, business, I was struggling there was no tours i couldn't do tours mm -hmm. um i keep in mind i uh, you know new orleans was probably one of the epicenters here in america because of mardi gras happened right before it hit mm, so right. um the mayor here kept it really strict so yeah. um you know i i had about a year of of getting some momentum um uh, prior to COVID, but when COVID mm -hmm. happened, I started to try to find different types of tours. And um, I knew that when COVID stopped, I'd be able to, you know, unveil these new tours. And that's what basically happened is I, um, even during COVID, you had people still buying, uh, you know, tours on my website and Airbnb is weird. They were like yeah. hoping, hoping that it will come back. Right. So They're like, as me... soon as I'm able to come back, I am coming back. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, you know, one of the things I want people to know personally, how I, you know, uh, improved is I would craft these tours and I really try to find different things that I could mix together. You right. know, uh, uh, you know, when you, when you search, uh, tours in New Orleans, you have these very specific types. You have ghost tours, you yeah. have the city tours, um, and then you have a cemetery, maybe a garden district tour, um, mm -hmm. and they're very specific. But what I began to do is realize some people uh, like a mix of things. Yeah, so I want to do more than just one, explore more than one facet. They're on a short period of time. You know, yeah. you're, if you're not doing tours for locals, they're only there for a few days. They'd love to pack in as much as they can, you know, without yeah. overscheduling themselves. 
So having yeah. one tour that offers multiple facets of uh, New Orleans is a great way to, to put that together. I, I think these I think travelers are really smart. Mm -hmm. And because of these all these new sites, if you're if the tour is is the same as another tour, the the the, the one thing that's gonna win is the reviews. If you have more reviews, then they're gonna pick that tour. But if right. you're trying to you know, m grow, you know, more products. And I think that's the most important thing in a tour business is to have more products. That's how you can make yeah. more revenue. Um, and if, if you can just take these different, you know, um, types of tours and mix them together, people will yeah. see that. So I, I think in COVID, I, I made a, a ghost and music tour. And I, I don't know how that worked and why <laughs> people like it, but people like the mix of those two things and it's it's uh, it's just a uh uh thing i worked out during covid trying to find different products and, yeah uh, yeah that don't exist you know so that's great so something to take away from what you just said is find the need fill the need right yeah, um, yeah. what you what you noticed wasn't around that you would have wanted you're like oh well nobody else is doing it I'm going to go ahead and be that guy who does it. And then when everything shut down in COVID, instead of just disappearing and being like, oh, well, you know, no more tours, you were thinking, well, what can I do better? Because when we are able to do this again, how do I differentiate myself? So yeah. your differentiators are really the fact that you can combine. People can basically a la carte, take a menu of different things to say, that they want to do, and you can put together a tour that incorporates all of those different facets. So. I think yeah. that was just really, you know, that that showed some real innovation on your part, not to just try to keep doing the same thing, but to really bring something else in. And again, a way to collaborate with other businesses, because that gives you a whole nother audience that is going to get, yeah. in, in, get you're, you're going to get in front of. And then it also just it brings revenue to more than just one company. And a lot of people will love and respect the fact that you're supporting their business, too. And we'll turn that back around. Yeah, and I, it sounds like people could do several different tours with you and not do the exact same tour, you know, two, three, four times in a row. Yeah, I I don't know. I think that, uh, you know, sometimes when creating these tours, you, you get stuck and you just don't know where to go. And yeah. I think the things that helped me was just to find tours that other people are doing and maybe you can combine them. And then what I did is I I would test them on. Airbnb experiences. Um, okay. And what that allowed me to do is that that space is a little bit different than let's say like TripAdvisor, Viator, or mm -hmm. these other places, because um, when people get on there, they're a little bit uh, looking for the word experience. It's not necessarily right. tour. Yeah. And, yeah. And they're, they're, um, they're more willing to, pick things that they ordinarily wouldn't do. Uh, so yeah. I, I put out a lot of ideas on Airbnb experiences that didn't work. And <laughs> I tried different titles, different pictures, different things. Mm -hmm. And then there were some that started to get some traction. And I realized yeah. that that test that I was doing, just adding these different ideas on there and seeing what people would pick, I ended up crafting a tour that I could shift over to my own website, you know? Okay. Yeah. So that's cool. So what you did was basically throw a bunch of things against the wall and see what stuck, right? Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people tend to either get frustrated or give up thinking that, oh, I thought this was such an amazing idea and nobody liked it. Therefore, no one will ever like any of my ideas. And that's yeah. just not the truth. You know, no. a lot of times, you know, you have to, uh, until you fail, a lot of times you don't even find that winner. If you just stayed complacent with something that was just kind of working, you know, here and there, yeah. You would never have, you know, given, a, you know, another risk or another chance, you know, to try to figure out, well, what else can I do better? How can I move this along? So yeah. hopefully somebody who's watching this, who is maybe in that same stuck place you were, gets an idea of, OK, what are some adjacent businesses that I can maybe work into what I do and, and bring that along? And as you said, the wording is really important. So instead of just saying pub crawl, it is, you know, a culinary and mixology experience, you know, yeah. right? Or, you know, instead of yeah. just music tour, it is, you know, the culture and history of jazz experience. So, yeah. um, you know, you're just having to, um, you know, understand the, you know, the SEO um, and also the mind of a traveler is how yeah. you figure out, you know, what people, what's going to resonate. With I think, I think people, I mean, honestly, to be honest with you, people would buy anything if it's sold correctly yep. uh, it's just the way it is uh, yep, and it's true 
and I guess that's from my sales background. I realized that, you know, um, they will, if it's put out there correctly and done right, um, they will buy it. So if you're looking to make a new tour, yeah. um, that new tour can work no matter what you, do. you just get. It has to be just put there correctly and they'll buy it, you know? Yeah. You know, and people need to be, you know, uh, fearless about, failure um, and fearless about asking questions. Put it put it out there to your past clients. Uh, put it out there, you know, in, in your Facebook groups or wherever it is that you you are to ask people what they think. You know, and that's that's definitely another way to just to be sure that the message gets out there and um, and see what am I missing? What could I do a little bit better? Um, it was it was really funny how a client of ours was the one who came up with the best swag item that I was so mad at myself for not coming up with myself. You know, if you're doing a winery and brewery tour um, and you're doing wine tours, she was like, oh, wouldn't it be cute to have like little uh, wine charms that say cork and keg tours oh, yeah. on them? And I was like, oh, my God. Yes. Why didn't I think of that? So sometimes yeah. the people who are on the other side of your business as people who enjoy it can be the best resource for good ideas. Exactly, exactly. And I, right. I, mean, I take feedback all the time. It's very yeah. important. So you mentioned reviews. Um, tell us a little bit about, you have um, a lot of really great reviews and reviews are what put you ahead of others because let's face it, you know, when you look up tours in New Orleans, there are hundreds of choices out there. And so it's not necessarily based on price anymore. It's more about who is going to give me the best experience. So what do yeah. you do, um, you know, to get reviews? How do you go about that um, to get that reputation up there and get those reviews going? Um, number one, um, it, it, my, I would say my tour wasn't always like that, where uh, it was like five star all the time. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, I had to shift and make sure things uh, align the right. So yes, the tour has to be set right for you to number one get the opportunity to get the uh, five star review. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, you know, I, I put things inside of the tour so people can. Um, remember these experiences and after the tour is over um, I want them to feel like they had a once in a lifetime different type of experience right. um, and I think that's uh, number one number one, is to have uh, a tour that uh, people can something could stay with them um, right and and there's ways you can you can go about uh, putting you know things in people's heads to just no matter what give you a, a five-star review uh, at the end of the tour typically what i say is uh i say if you haven't heard anything i've said so far please listen to this and then they're all like okay what's going on yes. <laughs> yeah yeah uh please give me five stars and yeah. um but that's a normal thing people do and um, yeah i think the reason why i get so many five stars is because my experience is so different yeah, well, you make them feel like they really did have an experience, not just not just a number, not just, oh, OK, they took me to three bars. We made a hurricane and then we drank some other things and then they're like, OK, yeah. you, high, you know, so yeah. it, it really did give them something that that they got. They could be immersed in, you know, the music and the and the the, the scene that you're, you're doing there. What do you think um, is the biggest misconception? about whether it's your tours or just New Orleans tourism in, in general? What do you think people think it is and what is it really in your in your view? You're talking about when they purchase it and then actually go on it, like uh, what they expect out of it prior to taking the tour? Well, so that's or... one, so yeah. So what do, they, what do they think they're going to get on the tour? And then at the end of the tour, they say to you, I had no idea that I was going to get blah, blah, blah. It was better than I imagined because of blah, blah, blah. You know what? Yeah. What is that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think number one, when you're writing your tours, it's best to uh, be as moder in, in moderation when you're ex ex you know trying to explain the highlights of the tour. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you want them to have a better experience on the tour than what they expected. And sometimes what I do is I um, I'll just leave out something they get. Uh, for example, they get an extra shot at uh the third venue and i'm just not going to tell you that and when i right. get there i'm going to say oh my god this is a surprise yes. get ready 
and uh, the lanyap, right? Yeah, yeah the lanyap, a little bit so, extra. A little bit extra. Oh yeah, I could tell you've been to New Orleans. Okay. Yeah. You know, Elazi Lavanto. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's go. Yeah. Yes. Oh, we're gonna close out the show with that yeah. one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but you're really right um, about that, Quay. Having a differentiator that isn't advertised that when they're on the tour they get a little something, they get that little lanyap. It's like, oh, yeah. I didn't expect that. This is even better than I expected. It's worth more than I paid for. It. And so, yeah. so you, um, one of the ways that you surprise and delight your guests is by uh, giving them surprises along the way that aren't even advertised. So, yeah. And there's, you know, also there's other things like I have like, a, there's an art market in the side of uh, a French ministry. And then uh, we work with a smaller company. They do glitter. It's like aloe mixed with glitter. And <laughs> there's bachelorettes on the tour. And of course, they love glitter. So, um, <laughs> True. I, you know, I contemplated whether to add that to, you know, the description, but I was like, you know what, that's one of those things that they're just going to um, feel that this uh, uh, over, you know, something they didn't expect they were going to get, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So that's like, that's another great tip. I mean, I feel like we're giving so many little gems from learning from what you've done on different things you can do to really continue to differentiate yourself and be the one that people choose. It's not about being the least expensive. As a matter of fact, sometimes that's a factor that, you know, makes people think, oh, if it's not an expensive, what am I even going to get for it? Um, yeah. Making your, your price reflect your value, but also making your value even more then the price yeah. when people get on that tour they they find out that it's not just what they saw written but there's even more uh coming their way so yeah. um so they think that they're going to get like you know a music tour um or they think that they're going to some pubs and they're going to make a drink they don't expect that they're going to get maybe that extra shot or that there's a glitter bomb available to them or yeah. um maybe like meeting you know other uh, artists along the way so yeah. you can keep some things you know keep some things under under uh under your vest and then walk, looking at the type of crowd, uh, crowd you have you can pull out some of those little extras based on you know whether they're a glitter group or they're uh, an art group or whatever yeah exactly it's just it, it i mean it's just more ammo to use to get five stars you know the whole yeah, goal exactly. of every tour is to get five stars because uh Man, it's uh, especially in New Orleans, there's companies that have been there for decades, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, I realized fast that <laughs> the more reviews you have, that's typically what they pick. Uh, yeah. but the only way to shift that is to have a different title, different name and different experience. So that's what I and think. to ask. You know, I mean, nobody just decides. Well, not nobody. Some people will, especially those of us who are in the tourism industry. I think yeah. those of us who are in it are more likely to unasked go ahead and do a review of somebody who really did something spectacular because we know, yeah. one, how much those reviews mean and two, how difficult it is to get them. But, yeah. you know, the regular public, they're not necessarily going to think about it, you know, all the time. So you got to ask. It's a pretty simple thing, uh, but that's the way to do it. It's That's just like it it's just like in um, I remember in sales, it's all uh, it, you have to ask to earn the right. And what I'd say is mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the tour, also, if I say if I feel that maybe some people are on the cusp of maybe not a five star, my worst is a four star. I hate the four mm -hmm. stars. So um, I would say something like I um, I tried my best to earn your five stars and when you say i'm trying to earn it hey yes. you know yeah, i did I my best you know <laughs> even if you didn't if didn't have the best time you thought you you should have had yeah. i tried my best and i i hope i earned it so um it's there all in the go. wording it's all in your wording it is you know that vulnerability and humility goes a long way for people to you know feel like you know this was even if like you said somebody's on the cusp you feel like they kind of their energy was a little bit lower knowing that you gave it your best is going to make them feel like you know what you know they really did do a good job it's not my it's not their fault i was having a bad day before this tour you know what i mean i mean there's you never know what's going on behind someone so i love that you make yourself vulnerable and you know and and show that kind of humility humility that people can appreciate. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's really cool, Quay. All right, so let's talk about a couple of things that I've been to New Orleans, uh, been to Bourbon Street and my much younger younger days, and I never knew anything about um, you know Frenchman Street, which yeah. I really wish I had because I've always been you know big into music. But then again, I was in my twenties and I probably just wanted to be on Bourbon. So um, yeah. 
Like one of the things I'm just going to bring out a little prop here and let's just talk about, you know, what people associate New Orleans with often. Oh, my grab bees. <laughs> let's go. All these bees. Now, we don't have to talk about how Renee got all of hers, but, you know, tell me a little bit about the culture around the bees, what they mean in New Orleans and, you know, what, what the misconception is about these beautiful baubles that I've got going on right here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, the funny thing on my tour is uh, what we've been doing is um, we've been using beads as a reward for our dance contest. Ah, and, uh, okay. And I'm telling you, if you got a nice bead, people are going to do anything for that bead. <laughs> They're going to drop it low, pick it up slow. That's how they, uh, you know, and it's it's hilarious it. that uh, it's just to add more excitement. But in general, uh, Mardi Gras beads, they uh, people don't realize Mardi Gras is a, f a family affair. You know, if yeah. you, uh, let's say you go uh, on uh, Mardi Gras day at eight in the morning, early in that morning, you wake up and you go to the Zulu parade, right? Okay. I've so heard of that. that is, that's what you do early in the morning, wake up, go to Zulu. And if you are on Orleans uh, at the end of the Zulu parade under the bridge, you're going to see a lot of families there, you know? Okay. Um, so, Typically, when people think of beads, they think of, you know, I got to show this. I got to. Right, right. And then I. By the way, I earned these in different ways. Oh, like yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's what I'm trying to tell people. No, it's not. You know, that's. I only have. I mean, typically, that only happens on Bourbon Street when you're going to say Right, that. right. Outside yeah. of there, when you're going to the parade, you have children and all that stuff. You're not going to, you know. But so uh, really yeah. a part, culturally a part of um, of the parades and of the Mardi Gras celebration. Um, yeah. That's more about what what is it? What's the the history behind it? Or just a little bit about why why beads? Uh, so beads have uh, they're they're throws. So okay. when you yeah when let's say you go to a parade, um, you know to be in the parade and be a part of a crew, uh, you have to you know pay to be part of that crew and inside of that pay people uh they buy your throws and throws consist of beads they also have other type of things like whether it's uh you know uh, dolls for the kids lightsabers and things like that and they'll give that out to you uh, oh very cool all right yeah. yeah i don't know if you want to be throwing lightsabers no <laughs> i you know my uh some of my family were here in the 80s and they said that back in the day they would they would throw these things and that was when things were unregulated. You could throw anything back in the right, 80s right. and all that stuff. That's so funny. So the so the misconception that we are just going to squash right now is that you know beads have to be earned, you know, in uh, by you know by flashing and yeah. that it's a really friendly place and that it's someplace yeah. that you know that is is a lot more than just Bourbon Street. You know, beyond Bourbon Street is something I think a lot of people really need to understand. And yeah. you've been able to really push that message, which is why your tours are are doing so well, is because you yeah. make people understand there's so much more to our culture, to our history, um, and so many more things to enjoy. So yeah. that's, that's, and I think that can be a challenge when you've got an area, uh, like for example, if you're a, a tour guide in New York and all people think about in New York, unless they're from, you know, the area is Times Square, or, exactly. you know, if you're a tour operator in Sonoma, everybody thinks just wine. So yeah. it sounds like you've really done some things to expose people to the other side of New Orleans that they, I'm sorry, Nolens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that they that they might not understand. Okay, wait. I have to ask another question. Sure. Is it really annoying when people call it New Orleans? <laughs> uh, no, because like let's say you have a like Kermit reference. Kermit reference. Uh, Kermit reference was a Trump player. Trump player rebirth. Uh, and he okay. was on the show Treme. He, he had speaking yeah. roles on that. So he guys gotten famous. When he does a commercial, he'll call it New Orleans or New Orleanians. Yeah. And it's more of like on a commercial. Even the mayor says it like that. So Okay. Um, I mean, I guess there's lots of ways you can say it, but most people just call it New Orleans. That's that. Yeah. So. There's a few different ways. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. so cool. Now, what about food? Let me ask that question, too, because you talked about combining the ghosts and the, you know, the mixology and the music and then, the, yeah. you know, the, the enslaved history. Um, you know, New Orleans is also really well known for food. So is there that component to your tours? Um, yeah, in my private tours, yeah, and okay. we, in our private tours, we you know work with different restaurants um, and include uh, you know a meal for the um, 
with the guest but uh, mm-hmm. uh food is huge here in new orleans um, yeah. um and there's several uh several restaurants if you were to come to new orleans i'd say go to dookie chase um uh, it's a restaurant um by miss leah chase miss leah chase was uh, had this restaurant and uh she was young with her husband and uh during the 60s there was a lot of civil rights things done inside of that restaurant also mm. the also the the movie uh princess and the frog right oh yeah yeah that's really? all based on leah chase right uh leah chase no. yeah and that restaurant that. so i recommend if you do go to come to new orleans uh that is a very historic african-american restaurant to uh check out and the food is amazing it's right uh right right next to treme very, very cool. I love, well, so, and what it really sounds like is, you know, you make yourself a subject matter expert on your tours and what you're up to. So that if somebody asks a question that's off the, you know, off the page, you know, it's not you know, necessarily directly related to exactly the straight line that you're, you're traveling down the tour. It's really yeah. important that you and your guides are able to show yourselves as somebody who really knows, uh, knows the culture, knows the area. So yeah. it's really, really great to see that you have you've kind of honed in on a way to put together a lot of these different um, elements that make up what everybody's interested in and wants to know about in New Orleans. Um, yeah. About your your uh, your public tours, have you found that as a tour operator, there is a max capacity that you really need to stay under in order for the tour to stay, you know, either attentive or stay, you know, cohesive? Did you ever have a mm-hmm. tour that was way too big and you're like, okay? More money, but more problems. We we got to shut this. You know, we got to scale this back. Has that did that happen? Well, I'm gonna say something. And hopefully, the city of New Orleans is not listening. Uh, but I <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago, I had a big big tour of uh, about a hundred people. And wow. uh, keep in mind, the legal limit per guide is 28 here in New Orleans. Um, okay, and you, I had realized, four, you had four guides along. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I did, um, but I, I would say uh, I. I did a lot of planning for that, but still, um, because it was still a very young business and how I had just started all that, I had probably took too much on to accomplish that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say that um, moderation is key. I wouldn't say if, uh, you know, if I got the opportunity to do it again, I, I would totally do it again. But uh, yeah, what were some of the things that you found that are different with a group of 25 than a group of 100? You know, aside from the obvious, you know, that yeah. many more people, but what made it, what made you, you know, think, okay, if I'm going to do this, I have to do these specific things to avoid X because something else that others who do walking tours or tours that could, you know, grow exponentially need to understand is what are some of the things you really need to be sure you know and be sure that you do when you have a, a max capacity type of group like that? Uh, it, the planning is key. I mean, I had planned that tour for about six months. Um, wow. But uh, I think what I learned is that you can't cut corners. And where I Ooh. went wrong was with, because uh, it did include food and all that. I had a vendor who quoted me a price and I was like, okay, that's a hey, really good food. And that price is pretty high. Let me okay. see if I could find <laughs> somebody else to do it for cheaper. Yeah. And uh, I did find someone to do it for cheaper. And I think I uh, they really messed it up for me. Yeah, you so kind of got what you paid yeah. for. Yeah, and and yeah, yeah. and I should have just uh, stayed with the original plan and. Um, Right. You know. Because they probably would have paid that amount. Right. I mean, was it so yeah. much more that it would have? Do you think no, uh, looking right. back in hindsight, was it so much more that it would have, you know, queered the deal completely and nobody would uh-huh. have uh, you know, taken the tour or would they have absorbed that extra five dollars in the ticket price and been OK with it? What do you think? Yeah, uh-huh. I you know, I, I personally just was, you know, trying to, you know, find a, a way to get the best profit. But, but sometimes uh-huh. doing that is not best you know you have to um really have a uh, reliable vendor and source mm-hmm. you know if you know that somebody has not been reliable in the past or gives you a, a really low ball price and there's a reason behind that and there's mm-hmm. a reason why people charge what they charge so um, yeah especially when it comes to food you have sure. to be careful and just realize that if there's an expensive 
part of the cost that's the food just just take it because it's uh one of those things you can't go wrong with you know well, yeah. I mean, especially if you go really cheap, if they use cheap ingredients, people can tell. Or if yeah. they, you know, aren't, you know, following safety standards, you could end up with people being sick. So yeah. you know, memorable food is is a is a huge deal. Uh, you know, yeah. especially if you're in a place that is a food city like New Orleans. So yeah. another another fantastic takeaway. Uh, I, I hope we're gonna put little captions on this because <laughs> it's, it's don't cut corners where it really matters. You know, take a little less profit or increase that price a bit, but really give yeah. you know the best. You know, I guess. I guess pretend your grandmama's taking this tour. Would you have served her this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, my grandma would have been like, what's wrong with you? Doing that? He's right? like, you know, you're not supposed to be doing that. But, you know, I, I, it's it's very important. You got to have, you know, I think food is the one part where you can't cut the corner. Some other places you can yeah, there's some places work you your can, way around. Yeah. But, man. I agree yeah. with you completely. You know, I mean, even when when we were, you know, trying to figure out ways to maximize our profit, uh, looking at sparkling wine, uh, you don't have to buy a twenty five dollar bottle of sparkling wine to, you know, to make it to be a good one. But you can't get a four dollar bottle that you don't even like. You know, find something in the middle that you would drink yourself, and then, you know, make a little bit less money, but make more people happy. Have them coming yeah. back and saying, "Where did that food come from? I want to go there." And then guess what? They tell people, "Oh." we tried your, you know, jambalaya on, you know, the big easy walking tour. And now I'm a client of yours. Yay. You know, so, so yeah, so you've got a great point about where to cut corners and where not to. You don't want to cut corners any place that would affect the experience for your guests. Cut corners on something on your back end that won't affect the guests, but not on something that could change how yeah. they feel about what you, you know, presented them with. Yeah, exactly. That is fantastic. Um, so what about on your tours? You talk, We talked about uh, you know, your, your diversity in your tours mm -hmm. all across age group, across you know, cultures, across race. Um, anything really interesting ever happened that you were like, okay, that's a first? So just have a little fun now. Let's talk about some of the fun stuff. Oh, with uh, doing tours in New Orleans. I can that's, only imagine. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of crazy stuff that happens, you know, it's just what it is. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you have all these different experiences, it, it was going to make you a better uh, business owner and, and better tour guide as well. Right. But, I, you know, um, you know, you got to do tours during Mardi Gras. Uh, and, you know, think about Mardi Gras is not just a one day event or week right. event. It's a couple weeks, you know. Yes. Um, and. Uh, you know, you'll have situations where people are are pretty um, rambunctious and crazy. You know, you don't say. <laughs> no, I just I remember uh, I was doing a tour, and I it was a it was a fun tour because it was a bachelorette, so I, I think. And all of a sudden, there was we turned, and there was a guy um, naked on a cop car, and then. Uh, only in New Orleans. <laughs> and then there was some, uh, and then uh, the mom of the of the tour got the naked guy to get off the cop car. The cop, the cop didn't want anything to do with it, and yeah. she's like, "Get off that cop car!" And he's like, "Yes, ma'am." And he was just <laughs> completely naked. And I was like, "Thank you that you help society for getting this man." <laughs> that is good. She just took control. Yeah, oh my he, God. she didn't want this naked man on that cop car whatsoever. Mm. Well, she, he definitely saw her and 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 took uh took what she said to heart. Yeah. That is so funny. Yeah, I mean because you know the tours aren't you know aren't contained. You've got other people around that can you know affect the experience one yeah. way or the other. So, you have to deal um, with a lot of different things. And I teach my guides like when let's say you're you're talking and people interrupting you, you have mm -hmm. to just push through. Yeah. And you don't um you know. What I learned in sales is if someone interrupts you, you just, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's rude, but you keep going with what you're doing. And yeah. at, at some point in time, that person that interrupts you will get the idea and shut up, maybe. So yeah, I take my guys, so whether it's a, <laughs> a, a guest that may be drunk and just wants to talk and agree yeah. with you on everything and maybe give you suggestions on what you're saying, you just got to right. keep moving and keep going, keep yes. pushing. Yeah. yeah, that's great advice. You know, and I think that's something else that some guides struggle with, um, not just guides, but also tour operators is finding that balance between making sure your clients have what they want and, you know, and they, they feel free to be themselves, um, but also not disrupting this tour so that it uh, affects the enjoyment for other people. 
So yeah. that's definitely, especially when there's alcohol involved, depending on how late your tours are, if you're doing a tour in the evening, they might've already been, you know, to Pat O'Brien yeah. a few times, you know? So yeah. you know, being able to, to, to train them to be able to deal with that type of a situation, um, you know, guess what? You get to be my guest guide for the day. Why don't you tell everybody about this over here? Oh, you yeah. don't know anything about it? Well, if they want to learn it and you want to learn it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting dealing with people. Um, what is what is the most rewarding for you about owning, uh, you know, uh, Big Easy walking tours? What's the most rewarding thing that you would say keeps you doing it every day? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I said earlier, like, uh, it's the hardest, easiest job I've ever had. Mm -hmm. um, but I think really it's just, you know, you're number one, I'm an African-American male and it's not often you see people owning things. We are, mm -hmm. I guess, are uh, at times we have not always been used to, you know, being the owners of things. Maybe being right. the consumers, but not the owners. So, I take pride in knowing that I'm able to own something, and uh, also that I can, you know, help people. I, I do love helping right. people. I remember reading this book. Uh, when I was in school, I was, you know, I studied business too, so a little bit in college and minored in it. And I uh, read this book, it was like Never Eat Alone. And it talked about Bill Clinton back in the day. And Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. every reason why everyone loved Bill Clinton, because you could walk around uh, everywhere people met Bill Clinton, he'd take their number. He's like, oh, you're an accountant. Oh, okay, cool. I'll write your name down. Oh, you, uh, yeah, you, you do taxes and or something else, a lawyer, uh -huh. every little person. So when someone asks him, hey, uh, do you got a lawyer? Do you have an accountant? He's like, oh, yeah, I know this person. And that was Bill Clinton. So I try to make sure people know who I am. And if I have something I can give to somebody, I definitely uh, help them out. Because at the end of the yeah. day, when you do that, people are like, oh, yeah, I do know somebody for a tour. I do know somebody for this and for that. That's Quay. So that's why uh, my takeaway from reading all that. Um, and then also uh, being a tour guide in New Orleans is really fun. You know, you right. are essentially you're getting to uh, uh, party every day with people wanting to have fun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think about when I did sit behind a desk, how much different my life is now. And I feel right, quite, right. quite <laughs> very blessed you know, to have have this opportunity to to do this, you know. That's awesome. I love to hear that. And I love what you said about, you know, never eating alone um, and bringing other people up with you. Uh, Magic Zon Johnson was a part of a, uh, of, a, of a meta conference that I was um, a speaker oh. on. And he was just talking about how people will remember how you helped them. They might not remember everything that you did for yourself, but they will always remember what you did for them. And, mm -hmm. and it's just really true. So even if it's just collaborating, bringing a, a group of 15 people to you know, a place that might be struggling. If two of those people come back and you got them two more, you know, clients in the door because of you introducing them to them, to that, you know, that to that establishment, it's huge. I mean, it really means a lot for us to be able to, to bring each other up. And there's so much competition, I would imagine, you know, in New Orleans yeah. to get people through those doors. So when you're bringing a tour through those doors, they know that they need to come correct so that those people will come back and tell others, oh, when you go visit New Orleans, take this tour and make sure and ask them if you can go to Blah, blah, blah. It's just the high tide rises all ships mentality that really, you know, separates you from some other tour operators that maybe just stay, you know, focus on just what they have to offer and just, you know, for themselves. So yeah, I love right. the community, the community aspect of it. OK, now we have to find out about uh, the biggest challenge. Um, and, you know, we all know COVID was a challenge for anybody who was, you know, in business then. So yeah. taking that out of the picture, um, whether it's when you first started or what your biggest challenge is right now, what is it that you um, struggle with the most and are looking to really improve upon within your business, whether it's on the back end or the front end? Um, I think anyone's biggest struggle is always trying to find ways uh, for people to find them. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, of course, I, I, I would love more business through my website specifically. Um, but I have to be honest with myself is that I have not been doing this for as long as other people have. Mm -hmm. And um, I, um, for my website, I think that um, 
number one, my big challenge was to change my website. And recently I was able to change that in the past year. Okay. And I use Gondola to um, mm -hmm. Vitaly over there, and he's a really cool guy. Okay. And he was just like, yeah, I could make your website look nice. And I was like, man, I've spent hours and hours to make my own website. And they um, were kind of cool because I, I just sent them over information. Yep. I sent them over what I wanted it to look like, and they did it for me. And uh, I think it was just affordable, number one. Okay. That script over wasn't expensive, wasn't thousands of dollars, even hundreds of dollars to do that. Was, what do you think the difference was aside from you know the aesthetics of how it looked uh, did something that they did at gondola for your website change your traffic versus what you had built yourself yeah um the the idea is for someone to get to the website make a buying decision immediately right mm -hmm. so you know they get there they're like okay this is cool do you want to buy this um yeah. that can really stop business so you want them to get to the website click book now see a calendar okay boom 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 get done with it and move on right. with their day. as opposed to my old website they had to like go through uh, three paragraphs of me talking about the tour and no wow. one's going to do that. unless they're really wanting to <laughs> research the tour people just like okay cool boom boom book All yeah right. so you got it streamlined you shortened up the, the, yeah. the text on it and made it a much faster buying decision yeah, exactly. Oh, that's that's good advice because uh, when I built my own website too five years ago, I was saying everything I wanted to tell people about the tour. Meanwhile, all they needed to know was in about the first twenty words. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, so yeah. So we have to kind of remove ourselves sometimes from something that we think is great and make sure that a professional can be part of that help. So, do you yeah, find yeah. that you're you're being found more? Is your SEO putting you at the top of somebody searches for um, jazz tour or walking tour in New Orleans? Are they going to find you? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, prior to the prior to my website shift, I, I don't think I really had any um, <laughs> website bookings. I mean, mm -hmm. I would have some every once in a while, but not for the my Frenchman tour. Um, okay, but. Uh, you know, it, it did really help make a shift where people are uh, actively buying on my website. Um, yeah. Now, um, I personally want to get my um, advertising of my website um, to improve. And that's where I'm going to where I'm heading now is, okay. uh, is typically the SEO and things like that. And uh, Yeah, I think you have to really kind of find one thing at a time. I mean, we can always pick yeah. something. There's always five things we can be doing to make our businesses better or to grow. We have to pick yeah. one, get it right, and then keep on trucking on to the next one, right? Or maybe if you're working on them simultaneously, just have to be really intentional about, uh, about what we're trying to accomplish so that we don't yeah. mix up, you know, our goals and end up going down some crazy, you know, rabbit hole without a. Yeah, you know, I mean, really, I mean, people are correct. Sometimes the advertising is like a could be like a black hole. So I'm really wary sometimes with my advertising. Um, but I did want to talk about something that has worked. I think that uh, that I'm currently working on. I mean, um, when you talk about Facebook and Instagram mm -hmm. ads and all that. Um, I think they're super important. And what I, I've learned just through being a musician and my own gigs is I can kind of shift what I do for, with that to the tour business. Right. And, um, you know, with my shows, what I do is I, um, I do ads specifically to people traveling in my city rather than, you know, living in mm -hmm. and getting that difference, uh, really helps tourists versus locals and I yeah. can target uh, either one for specific things. So um, me learning how to do that really <laughs> helped uh, be able to you know, make some uh, shifts there. So learning um, how to um, create the, your uh, your target audience when you are yeah. doing Facebook and Instagram ads, you're talking about making sure that you have an audience that is not, you're not looking for the locals for, you know, these particular tours. You're looking to reach yeah. people who are going to be coming to New Orleans. So yeah. you need to learn how to create that correct audience. So that's something that people should to definitely look at when they are doing a Facebook ad. Make sure it's hitting those people who you're trying to reach, not just within 20 mile radius of, you know, where your your, your business is pinned. Yeah, because I mean, I've wasted tons of money, honestly, mm. not knowing what I was doing with the Facebook and 
Instagram ads, and it's just to yeah. be target, be really targeted with and intentional with your advertising. Oh, uh, so smart! Know. You know, it becomes more of a you know more of a smart bomb than a shotgun blast. And yeah. learning how to do those audiences really is important. Uh, that's something I spent a lot of 2019 and 2020 uh, yeah. teaching myself is how to figure out how to you know get these these ads uh, and these audiences you know really drilled in on age on demographic on interest um yeah. you know you can you know you can make your ad for people in new york and make sure that it says um it says jazz it says music it says history it says yeah. you know all the different things the word beignet <laughs> you know whatever it is anything that that can put somebody who is a who travels into New Orleans and then onto your tour, all of those types of words can be a part of your ads on uh, Facebook and Instagram. And they do change things. Uh, I see a yeah. lot more out of town guests now because I changed um, instead of, you know, doing just my locals, which I do locals, you know, for the tours, yeah. but also changing up an audience that reaches anybody within 250 miles, for example, so they can drive to yeah. my region. Okay, that's it. So you know, when you can, when you start to figure out those things and change your audience, you really can just start to grow and grow and then you get more out of town. So that's yeah. great. I'm glad you, you've uh, uncovered that. It takes people a long time sometimes to, to change that. Yeah. And, you know, also like if you're trying, um, trying to grow your like Facebook audience and um, even, Inst well, I would say specifically Facebook, what I was able to do is I found like a, you know, local content, like, let's say it's something in your 50 mile radius around your city, um, mm -hmm. uh, whether I mean, with me, it was specifically a brass band video. So I found okay. a, there are a big six brass and one of my favorite brass bands here in New Orleans. And they had this really cool song video that was it was on YouTube. And, I, okay. you know, typically what I, just, what I did is just take it from YouTube and put that on my page. And I just saw a whole bunch of locals liking my page that ordinarily wouldn't like it because uh -huh. of this local content, you know? Okay. And they were just like asking me questions and all types of stuff. And um, if you can find some like local content, um, people around you, I think, are are more uh, readily available to click like on your Facebook page, you know, yeah. whatever it is. That's great advice. That's uh, it's it's really important, you know, to show yourself to part of the community by supporting others outside of just your business. And yeah. so uh, another good gem that you just shared there is see what's happening around you to get eyes that wouldn't necessarily be looking for you. But if you're the one who points them in the direction to see what they are looking for, they might be like, oh, who is this guy that just told me all about that? You know, yeah. it's the long game. It's not, you know, everything is not a direct you know, one, two sale. A lot of times you're going like this to get that sale um, yeah. or just to get that brand awareness and, you know, bring people in to, to see you as someone who supports the community, not just your own business. So yeah, exactly. kudos. I love that. I, I, I have the same mentality uh, with advertising and with community. And it's really been a, a blessing for my business. So what do you want? What do you want to happen Quay? Um, in five mm -hmm. years? What's happening with Big Easy uh, walking tours? Um, man. I mean, it would be a blessing if Big Easy Walk Tours is like one of the biggest tour companies in New Orleans. That would be awesome. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's very, um, the percentage of that happening is uh, pretty good. I, I mean, I, I mean, there's there's companies here, but there's a lot of ways I, I could fit into these, these spaces, but they're not utilizing. Right. So I would like to grow it. I would love... Uh, for there to be um, this whole, uh, I guess, movement of African American tour guides in New Orleans. Yeah, uh, I think there's a city where there's so many culture bearers. Whether the Mardi Gras Indians, they have the the social and pleasure clubs, they have the music, the brass bands, the all these different places. I, I wish some of them would love would you know, get involved and talk about uh, <laughs> that stuff to the tourists uh, like uh, like I am now. So that's my goal is right. to really um, share people that this is a possibility of something they could do 
too. Is there a good tourism um, bureau there in um, in New Orleans that yeah uh, you know, that does reach out or like even into the the high schools to you know show tourism as a career path or you know how do you reach the younger people and how do you reach you know other uh, you know uh, whether it's blacks in tourism or in other um, fields that you would love to see let them know listen there's a space here that we need to start you know filling up there's a there's a need for us to be out there to share what our culture is with others, with each other, but also with others, you know, outside of our own culture, outside of our own race. Where, yeah. where do you want to find those people? Do you have some, some resources to look for? I have some, but I hope mm -hmm. to have more, um, you know, it's just really not a, it doesn't come to mind to people for some reason. Yeah, exactly. Sure. And uh, I think what I'm going to have to do is uh, make it a option by exactly going to these bureaus and um yeah. you know I, I i i have done a lot of things in schools uh and talked about it uh but you know i i it has to be a little bit of a broader uh reach for me to really get get, pe get it in people's minds that it's a can be a career option and and they need yeah. more of people because i mean when you yeah. look at new orleans and tour guides it's just it's i'd say right now there's 90 percent uh, of the tour guides are not african-american right and uh, but a lot of the businesses that they are going to are part of the culture and the heritage yeah and yeah. you know it's it's interesting you know it's really a weird yeah. thing yeah you know and it's something that i think a lot of people really don't rec really recognize or see as oh that is something i could do but you know just rolling it back to kind of tie in with the musicians you know, you're gigging at night, you're trying to figure out, you know, how to get your face out there, your name out there, and then, you know, doing a day job to try and, you know, put food on your table while you're trying to still, you know, you know, work your craft. I would think that that was just a natural fit for somebody. Look, these tours are this many hours a day, you can earn this much. Um, and it's, it's be a good way for somebody who is trying to, you know, basically follow your path. You know, I think yeah. you can really inspire some of these other musicians who are like, you know, yeah, you want to, you know, you want to do your music, but you also have to do things to you know, pay those bills. And so, you know, let's work together. Let's build a network of, of those of us wanting to do that. I, you know, what I found is that they, they, they do admire what I'm doing, and and they they just don't know how easy it is. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not rocket science. I'm not. Right. That's, I'm not necessarily reinventing the wheel. A lot of the oh, stuff no, that yeah. I've learned, you know, they have books, they have things, and all you have to do is. You know, record me what I say, and you can say whatever you feel is appropriate. And, it, and that's there what I—that's what I'm doing currently. It's going to take a little bit of time. Sure, <laughs> I'm going to get these people that <laughs> don't think they can do it to, to to do it. You know. So, what would your and we'll, we can maybe end on this? What advice would you give to somebody who wants to start? A walking um, tour who you know who has the the gumption and they have the um you know that they, they want to do it but they don't really know what to do is there anything that you would caution somebody who says all right i'm going to start a walking tour uh, what would you tell them they like the top two or three things they need to know that you didn't know when you started it that really helped you you know aside from oh. some of the obvious things well, what what did you find that was a surprise to you that you want somebody else to know about well, if they're already saying I want to start a, a, a walking tour, I love that confidence. If they're yeah. confident enough to say that, then they can do this. Um, I, I would say, number one, um, organization is key. Um, if you can organize, because we're not necessarily in an office space. A lot of time you're out in the, out doing walking the streets or mm -hmm. somewhere and um, finding a, a a place to organize is very key. Um, and um, if you're working with other companies, get used to hearing no a lot. I heard no there for a long, long time. And, mm -hmm. you know, but I, you know, I'm used to it specifically because of sales. I heard no's sure, and sure. no's this, no that. But to me, when you hear no, it's just tomorrow's yes or you know, right. Or it, it leaves space open for the, the better thing to come along. You yeah. know, if we haven't if we hadn't heard no on several different things um, that at the moment you're just blown. You're like, dang, I really wanted that. 
But if that opportunity had come through, the next one that did say yes is an even bigger and better one. So, you know, no's are just the way to build up. You know, I like I stack my no's on top of each other and that helps me to reach, you know, whatever comes yeah. next. And that next yes is really where I actually wanted to be to begin with. So that is I, really great advice. And I also say that, you know, in, in jazz music, you have something called, you know, the, you know improvisation. Mm -hmm. And that's just, you know, uh, using what you know and creating on the spot. And this is one of the industries I think that you can be most creative. I don't know any other, really many other <laughs> types of business where you can like really create what you want to create and people are going right. to buy it. There's always some type of uh, something that holds you back or you need to stick to. With tours, yeah. you can be as creative as you want to. And at times, the more creative, <laughs> the more money you'll make. So, you hey, know. listen, as my husband says, like, Renee, you know, you like to baffle them with BS. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, what? He's like, he's like, you know what you said wasn't true, right? And I was like, oh, no, no, no. I didn't lie because I believed what I said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you, know, I, you can definitely, you know, a little, you know, you can embellish, you can make it feel and, you know, and be a part of, you know, the story. I'm not saying you can lie to people, but you can also, you know, you can give them what you think. I think this happened like this, but, you know. Yeah. You really well, I, you wrong. know, the great thing about the, the thing about history is you have to understand, uh, Maybe it's something that you've read mm -hmm. is being retold by somebody else. So this could always be their point of view. But if yeah, you can imagine, yeah. if you can imagine, uh, based on the history that you know what may have happened, uh, you can paint an even more vivid picture. You know, and that vivid picture may mm. not be wrong, right, you know, or incorrect. It's just a uh, you're trying to get people to see it in their brains while they're hearing you. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and you know, that's really an interesting point there, too, is really kind of getting them to to get into their own minds and, and let them create their own story around, you know, what what you see. That's probably one of the allures of, of ghost stories. I know when I've ever been, uh, you know, we have some haunted wineries yeah. around here. I love to think about, um, you know, what the ghost was, you know, be before she became a ghost, you know, what she ate, what she sat around thinking about, you know, what would make her angry, you know, those little things like that. So you can really, um, your, your mind starts to kind of wander into this place of creating your own reality, I guess, around some of the stories that exist. So yeah, if you, if you, if you paint that little baseline for somebody then they start putting things on top of it, you yeah. know, I mean, kind of like I'm music, building that harmony. Yeah, I mean, there's some people here in New Orleans that they have their whole routines, or whether they're dressed like pirates or just mm -hmm. like a vampire would look, and that's cool. Yeah. And how they fit. Um, sure. My thing is, I talk to people like I'm talking. I may talk to a group of twenty, like I like it's just one person in front of me. Sure, uh, exactly. Like a private tour specifically, but I, what I my difference instead of dressing up were, um, you know, all that as I. Uh, I have specifics and I, I, I'm making things as vivid as possible. So sure. whether, you know, like, uh, for example, the, one of the biggest ghost stories in New Orleans is the story of the Lollary mansion. And that's all the one that was in the American horror story and coven and all that. And, okay. you know, and that story has been told a million times with all types of different tour guides, but there's so much information about that lady. That's so interesting is that she was an Irish Creole and, um, you know, whether it's how long her hair was or how red it was or all these yeah. little specific things, people, people really start to build all these little, um, ideas in their head. And oh, yeah. the that story, they'll have a, a movie, you know? <laughs> so, well, it's cool. You leave it to their imagination and they leave with that still in their minds. You don't feed them everything. You let them, you know, leave them wanting a little bit more, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. That's really, I, I I love your story, Quay. I love that, you know, you just took that on and that you were like, look, I can do this. And so what does your mom think? I guess that's where we end. What does your mom think about your <sighs> little core company now? Well, hey, mom, I told her I was doing this today. She's like, oh, my God, thank God. Okay. I love it. But uh, uh, my mom is, uh, she's coming along. She's, she can, she knows my website and yep. she's gone on the tour with me. And she was a tour with about. 22 people and wow uh, it was nice that she's got be able to see me and my element and all that so her perception changed you know and from uh you know 
being a, uh, my baby's a tour guide to now he has a tour business, you know? There you go. Exactly. So, yeah. And making our mom and our dad proud is all we ever want to do in our lives. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, this has been great. Well, I really am excited that we got a chance to sit down and talk about this. I think that anybody who has either has a walking tour company that maybe is struggling or maybe it's doing well, but you're looking for some new ideas. Mm -hmm. Or if you've been considering starting one and don't really recognize whether or not you can, is there any pitfalls or something that I need to be aware of? I love that you said, uh, just go and do it. You know, you're going to figure it out. It's it's a great way um, to be an entrepreneur. It's a great way to, to be able to combine some things that you love, you know, into into cash flow, you know, as a, as a guide with it. Um, so how do people find you? Give us your, your contact information for your tours so that they can check that out. And if you, if anybody wants to talk to you about actually the tourism industry, aside yeah. from actually booking a tour, how do we yeah. find you? Tour? Sure. Um, you can find me at uh, big easy walking tours.com. Um, and seven ways social media. You can find me at big easy walking tours uh, at, uh, at Big Easy Walking Tours on Instagram mm -hmm. um, and um, Big Easy Walking Tours uh, at gmail.com is my email. Um, okay. Easy I was about to give my phone number, but if you want my phone number, you're going to have to email me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I'll give it to you. You can call me anytime you want. Don't worry. There you go. Leave something, you know, leave a little bit of something that they have to work for to get. So yeah. that's great. Well, this has been wonderful. I appreciate your time today. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to tell everyone before um, we say au revoir? <laughs> um, I, I, I would just say that tourpreneur has been a blessing to me. Mm -hmm. I've implemented so much stuff that people talk about. And I think it's an amazing community um, that's been put together. And uh, I just think uh, I'm just grateful that you guys uh, invited me. I would I love that I was able to share my story with you all. Well, your story is a great one, and it's one of perseverance and innovation and filling that need, seeing a need, feeling a need. So really appreciate you being here. Appreciate Tourpreneur for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about your story, because the next time I go to New Orleans, you know you're going to see me, and we're gonna, I'm, I'm going to do your tour. I'm excited yeah, about that. Yeah, with those so, bees on. Yeah. Hey. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Quay, Quay. Well, thank you so much, Quay. This has been so much fun. And uh, laissez la bon ton roulé. Good times roll, yeah. <laughs> Let the good times roll. That's right. All right. Cheers. Thank you so much.